Well, thank you everybody for hopping on again. Sorry for rushing in right at two o'clock. Uh, appreciate everybody being here today. And I cannot get rid of that captioning below when I'm presenting. So <laughs> it's helpful to anybody else out there. I've tried to click it a few times. Um, so I'll kind of just jump right in. Uh, Brian Gavin, uh, sales executive with Avalara. Uh, I work on our Sage team. And we also have Wendy Leonard today, our product engineer, that's going to show you guys a demo of the product as well. So we appreciate you guys hopping on. Uh, quick blurb about me. Um, obsessed with that little one right there. Uh, that's my daughter, Gracie. And I worked for ADP prior, uh, then Avalara. Didn't think that payroll tax was exciting enough, so hopped over to sales and use tax. And it is much more complicated than that, if anybody's familiar with payroll. And uh, Wendy, anything to add yourself? Just a quick intro. Um, product solution engineer at Avalara. I've, uh, this is all I've ever done is tax and technology, and I've done it for a couple decades, and I find it interesting every single day. So that's, that tells you a little bit. And just to share with you guys, you know, Wendy is kind of the team behind the brains of it and the tech, you know, the technical aspect of it. So we lean on our product engineers a lot. Um, you know, with a lot of our customers with regards to different connectors, extractors, situations. So Wendy really supports our team um, when we're working with different customers. So to dive right in uh, today, the agenda, first and foremost, you know, I think in the past three years, a lot of people are webinar out. So I love informal um, presentations. If you have any questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat. I'll take a breather and stop and answer any questions, but I, you know, I really want you guys to get the most out of this uh, as much as possible. Kind of share with you a little current state of the business and kind of our best practices and how we can talk about, you know, compliance uh, for our customers, because that's where most of our conversations do start. Just a little overview. Uh, we're very big on education. So Nexus. Uh, Nexus is, like I had mentioned, you know, compliance ends up being a lot of the initial discussions. I would say eight times out of 10 when I am speaking with a new customer that's either calling inbound into Avalara or is brought to us by a referral from Acumen. It's a business owner that's really trying to understand where their tax liability is, whether it's physical presence, whether it's economic nexus, um, really just determining, you know, where should I be filing and remitting for sales tax and or use tax. Big change, uh, as hopefully many people are aware, um, in having to deal with the Wayfair decision that had came down. You know, this really changed, you know, this was a big trigger event at Avalara. Um, you know, when this was passed in, call it late 2018, you know, it required businesses to collect tax based on sales volumes rather than just that physical presence. So, you know, these laws really impacted, you know, manufacturers, distributors, highly exempt sellers uh, in a very large way. You know, I had businesses really looking at, you know, reviewing the laws and determine where they would need to get registered um, if they weren't urgy registered just because of physical presence. You know, understand that, you know, if you have to add new states, um, you know, you have to have access to those tax rates in all those new states and, you know, getting properly a lot, you know, some of the calls as well, people that have been selling into those states and not aware that they've crossed those thresholds because, you know, the thresholds vary state by state. So a lot of our calls are really in the beginning, not even talking about software. It's really talking about compliance and identifying where these businesses really need to be registered based off of changes in laws. And obviously all the laws are different in all of um, different states. You know, kind of continuing a little bit with how this really impacted business owners, you know, it gave the states the thumbs up to, you know, basically look at different economic activities in their state, which would require a business to register and collect sales tax. A big one that comes up a lot are trade shows. You know, it's activity of, you know, businesses attending trade shows and not even specifically, and this is just an example, but not even specifically selling something at that trade show, um, just attending a trade show in another state could trigger Nexus. Remote employees is a very big one. 
Um, you know, a lot of our clients whose sales are typically exempt, you know, they might assume that economic nexus doesn't apply. And that's a really big miss. You know, many of the states include exempt sales and services in their threshold accounts for transactions. But if they make 200 transactions of a dollar pencil, that would hit those thresholds. So, you know, with that said, you know, like I had mentioned, a big part of our conversations in the beginning is really looking at the activities of a business to determine if that business has triggered nexus in any specific states. Um, you know, some CPA firms and accounting firms do this, but we have a whole compliance department that is really focused on assisting our customers with identifying all this. You know, have you created physical nexus? You know, as I had mentioned, you know, trade shows, but traveling salespeople um, is a big one that comes up a lot on calls. You know, do you utilize contract labor in the state? Um, you know, remote employees. I became a remote employee in the past few years. Um, a lot of businesses have had a lot of hiring. I know Avalara has still continued to hire remote employees. Uh, personal property, if you own or lease property in another state outside of your headquarters state, do you promote products or services in another state? Again, kind of following in the lines of what I had mentioned about trade shows and doing exhibits in other states. You know, it's a lot of questions that we kind of uncover in a survey, which I'll get to shortly when we kind of talk about risk assessments, but it's just Bottom line is Nexus laws are really complex and they're different in every single state. And, you know, review those laws in each state. You know, we kind of go through in our training coming on board with Avalara, you know, just really looking at how complex and looking at how different all of the states are, um, kind of just as an eye opener. And, you know, with all of those different changes and different tax laws, you know, the calculations, the filing and remittance. Um, can become quite difficult when you're dealing with multiple states. So the excess, uh, economic nexus thresholds by state, here's just a few. Um, the majority of states, and again, it, it doesn't carry, you know, when I make this statement, I, I want you to know it only applies kind of just as a majority speaking, but it's based off of $100,000 in sales or 200 transactions into a state. But as you can see with some of these, you know, stats on the right, you know, some states will only count those sales if they, uh, or without, um, excuse me, it won't count both of those thresholds. So some will consider the, you know, taxable gross receipts. Um, some will only just consider the sales and not the transactions. Um, some states like Alabama, where exempt sales are included, and in some states where they're not. Um, so again, it varies significantly by state and our risk assessment is truly where we kind of identify this state by state. You know, there's two maps that really show the changes that had happened. Um, if you're not, you know, if, for those that are not familiar, obviously on the top right, you know, five states we call NOMAD as a, you know, a quick um, reminder to us that New Hampshire, Oregon, Montana, Alaska and Delaware have no sales tax. Um, but, you know, just the significant change since 2019 um, about how many other states that have been impacted by this. We still have um, Montana and, you know, Florida that, you know, haven't done anything yet. There's still those five states that don't have sales tax. And there's a caveat with Alaska that does not have sales tax, but does varying state or sales tax rules in 110 different cities. And those cities are trying to like force out sellers to collect local taxes. Um, current state of the business, oops, my apologies. Sorry about that. There we go. You know, to really share how complex things are, you know, it's 152 million different mailing addresses. You know, we, you know, there's 12,000 jurisdictions for sales and use tax rates. Uh, one of the things, like I'd mentioned before, when we start our training with Avalara is looking at a state like Colorado. You know, they, they give us an exercise of looking in Colorado 
and seeing how, you know, in one county, you could have multiple different rates, um, even just across the street. Um, Colorado's, you know, a very complex state when it comes to sales tax. Millions of different exemptions for services and products. And, you know, obviously different um, buyer and seller exemptions as well. Product taxability, um, you know, another big focus, especially in manufacturing distribution that we deal with a lot with Sage. Um, you know, there's 1800 different rules. It's very impossible to track all of them. You know, for example, you know, Indiana, you know, Nestle Crunch is taxable when Kit Kats and Twix are exempt. Um, you know, Kit, Kat, Kit Kats and Twix have flour, so it's not really considered candy. Um, cotton balls are exempt if it's, you know, considered for medical device, but cotton, you know, cotton rounds are considered cosmetic. So, you know, another interesting one that, you know, we learn in training too, if anybody's been to New York and someone asks you if they want to cut the bagel for you, do you want the bagel cut in half? There's sales tax applied to when that happens. Um, so, you know, it's, these are some of the kind of, you know, for lack of better words, um, you know, silly different <laughs> product challenges, but, you know, we share them a lot um, because there's, you know, hundreds of different challenges that businesses face when it comes to that. And we kind of help, you know, identify with businesses. Um, common question or statement that we will get is, but most of my sales are exempt, so I don't have any sales tax problems. And, you know, I know that many of the audience today might be manufacturers and, you know, these are just examples of how economic nexus has uh, affected manufacturers. You know, if a state looks at gross sales and their economic nexus thresholds, remember that all sales transactions count, whether they're to the end seller or not. So if you trigger nexus in a state, you'll most likely have to collect an exemption certificate. A lot of our initial calls when we're really not talking about software are around exempt sales and the certificate process, which you know myself and Wendy will go into a little bit. But we help a lot of businesses when it comes to, you know, they don't have a good exemption process certificate or for they don't have a good process in place for collecting exempt certificates. They're outdated. Um, you know, they've kind of taken it you know, on the honor system and they really want to get compliant. So, you know, this really helps, you know, as we'll share in a coming slide, how we can assist businesses with those exempt sales. Kind of going into, you know, is it a tax exempt sale? You know, the different exemptions are based around use-based, entity-based, product-based, um, you know, is the exemption certificate required um, for those particular um, exempt sellers aren't exempt from economic nexus. And some states include exempt sales in their thresholds as well. Anything in the chat yet? Nothing yet. Okay, cool. I just want to take a stop for a second. Um, remote selling thresholds for non-taxable sales. You know, a lot of the states after the Wayfair decision um, trickled into, you know, when putting these laws into effect and the effective dates, um, you know, for, as you can see, Colorado exempt sales counted, um, and they base it off of dollars, but no transactions, you know, California, basically the products count, but services don't in California, sales and transactions are both recorded. And then in Tennessee, you can see how significantly more those sales dollars are compared to other states and um, exempt sales don't apply. Again, just kind of sharing the complexity and you know how the states vary so much. 81% um, of these nexus studies that we do will expose you know, kind of some issues with physical presence, you know, whether it's around, like we've mentioned, product taxability, um, jurisdiction assignment. So, you know, truly identifying where the tax rate is by that particular address. Um, exemption certificates, like we just touched on, state and local tax prep and filing, and then audit readiness. You know, a lot of 
our phone calls, like I had mentioned about compliance, really come down to these core six. When we're looking at kind of audits, um, you know, I truly feel like most of the calls that we do have, it's people getting audit ready or, you know, they kind of feel like there is an audit coming on and, you know, there's a reason, you know, it's not every day that people want to wake up and talk about sales tax and compliance, you know, 60% of our audits target, um, you know, 60% of all these types of industries and, you know, mostly all of these sage customers that I deal with fall into um, these types of industries. You know, most common mistake by auditors, as you can see, is, you know, nexus oversights, not really identifying that if you did trigger nexus, when did you trigger nexus um, in a particular state? You know, as we will see, or if I had mentioned earlier, you know, our risk assessments, you know, we take a four, you know, we'll take a look back, you know, four to five years to determine when that business truly created Nexus. And when we do a risk assessment, we're trying to, you know, accomplish, you know, one of three things, either A, we need to just register in that state and move forward. B, we might need to just register and do a back file to get caught up. Or C, in some cases, we'll do a voluntary disclosure where we basically go to the state on behalf of the client unanimously and basically state that we weren't aware that we created Nexus and that we're looking to you know, come forward and register and pay any liability that's due and waive any fines and penalties. So trying to tackle this before an audit comes about, um, you know, it, it truly can save a business significant money um, and cost and expenses with regards to you know, different penalties and fees, especially with um, the VDA process. Um, you know, I, I've seen some situations where, you know, the penalties and fees and, you know, by no means do I want to, you know, share Avalara's, you know, software and services by fear, but, you know, I, I've seen some situations where, you know, the penalties and fines can be very, very significant um, for a business. So, you know, we're hoping that, you know, we get to do risk assessments prior to any issues. One thing about um, voluntary disclosures, just to add, you are not able to do voluntary disclosures in most states if you've already registered. So, you know, kind of a rule of thumb and kind of what I'm talking to like best practices as we move forward, you know, if you're not aware of, you know, when and if you triggered Nexus in a state and you think that there's a question mark around it, it's always good to have Avalara or a CPA firm or accountant you know, look into that data. And as I've explained, doing a risk assessment to really identify um, if it's a problem. Because again, if you do register, it takes the voluntary disclosure off the table. So we always, you know, when we're in the process of doing these risk assessments with businesses, you know, we tell them don't take any action, like let Avalara, you know, complete this survey or complete the survey for Avalara so we can do a debrief. So kind of keeping with the, um, topic of risk assessments, that's where most of our conversations start is the way I like to explain, you know, the process is in two phases. The past and the present is us doing a risk assessment and identifying, you know, what was done prior to today, you know, where did you possibly trigger Nexus, where should you be registered, where are you registered, based off of, you know, economic Nexus, different activities, and physical nexus obligations. And then looking at doing the integration with Avatax for the software piece is the future. So past and present is the compliance. And then the future proof, the way I like to kind of share the two phases is the software. So the risk assessment really is the blueprint for us to identify what we should do next and how we should set a business up with Avatax, with exemption certificates, really identifying what it is because Avatax is garbage in, garbage out. Any business can tell me, hey, we file and remit in these states, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we're hundred percent compliant. And I always ask, you know, when was the last time you had done a risk assessment? You know, have you been tracking Nexus by state in any states that you sell and collect into um, or sell into and check thresholds, whether it's dollars or transactions or products, et cetera. 
So we have a basic assessment. Feel free for anyone on the line that um, you can either reach out to me or it's on the Avalara website. Typically, you know, again, a risk assessment, a free risk assessment is a free risk assessment. It's very basic. It doesn't go really in depth. Then we have the full and premium assessments. And the best way for me to explain kind of the difference in them is the look back period. So a premium assessment is really going to do a look back on when Nexus was created, um, you know, and if there's anything that we need to handle from a compliance standpoint there forward. We typically push to do premium risk assessments and considering that, you know, sometimes this comes in from a partner, um, we're able to discount because um, a lot of people do look at that and say, hey, that's a lot for just doing a report, but it is actually very highly competitive with different CPA firms and accounting firms. So as I kind of explained, the risk assessment, um, it says, you know, this says four to five days. Um, you know, typically a risk assessment gets done as quick as it's a priority for the business. So I've had risk assessments be completed in one to two days, meaning that survey is sent to the customer and the customers, you know, basically answering questions about different activities of the business, states in which they operate in products, you know, how they go to market. Once that risk assessment is completed, the survey and sent back to Avalara within, you know, call it a few days sometimes, but it could be within a week or so for our team to go through the whole survey and identify where all the nexus obligations are. We set up a debrief call with tax directors. So we have a very close knit team of tax directors that hop on a call and truly will walk through the risk assessment with a business owner. Once we have that blueprint, then we look to do the software purchase and implementation. We typically say 104 days for implementation. I've seen the average sometimes be 75 days. Again, very similar to the risk assessment. A, you know, it's how much of a priority is this? Like I mentioned, I've had, you know, risk assessments done within a week by businesses, but then, you know, I still have some risk assessments out there that were purchased three or four months ago because, you know, another project kind of, you know, took precedent. Voluntary disclosures for us to complete that whole process of, you know, getting everything cleaned up with a state prior and getting everything set up moving forward takes about four months. So we do some of the compliance paperwork typically on the front end before we handle out a lot of the, you know, purchase and implementation of the software piece. So as we have a pre-built integration directly into Sage, so you're basically replacing that native function of Sage with Avalara's tax engine. So basically, you know, all of those invoices and transactions are gonna ping off of Avalara's tax engine and replace whatever native functions in Sage. As we had mentioned, you know, if there is an exemption certificate or if it's an exempt sale, and if that's mapped to the customer, it's gonna point back with a zero to tax, uh, tax determination. And, you know, with that said, these are all, like I mentioned, they're mapped to all of the customers. And I'll explain a little bit for it, I believe on a slide um, about how we kind of clean that up a little bit with the cert capture piece. And lastly, us collecting all of this data we're able to file and remit the returns on your behalf because we're capturing all the data. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. Um, so streamlined sales tax program. Best way for me to um, really break this down in layman terms is the late 90s, uh, 24 states got together and basically stated that, or basically suggested that a lot of business owners either A, take the um, risk exposure on and, you know, won't come forward and register and kind of take that gamble. Um, or it's just an education piece. It's not understanding all those changes with the laws as well from 2018 and for 2019 and forward that they really do um, create, you know, have a nexus obligation to remit and file in a specific state. So in order to, you know, kind of incentivize business owners, basically the streamlined sales tax program is if, as long as you go through a certified provider, 
Avalara being one of them to file and remit your sales tax. There's a lot of free stuff for lack of better words that can be applied. And I always look at this from a sales consultant point of view as a very heavy discounting tool. So I will take a customer's data and really determine and try to qualify in those 24 states if they're a good fit. And if they are, one, the registration into that state is at no charge. Two, the returns, whether they're monthly, quarterly, or annually, there's no fee for those returns. So they're taken off of our proposal or quote, if you want to call it. And then lastly, all those transactions that you're paying Avalara's tax engine for, basically, we deduct those from the pricing as well, um, because the state reimburses us for all of those, the returns, the registrations, and basically the transaction count. And and we when we deal with a lot of businesses that are in a significant amount of states, we're talking 5, 10, 15, 20, typically, it always falls in the favor of about 50% of states will be considered SST. And in order to qualify for SST, a business A um, cannot have employees with more than $50,000 in payroll in that state, or B, not having any physical um, presence in the state. So not having another you know, place of business in that state. There's, you know, those are the two of the main qualifiers. And again, you don't have to qualify for all 24 states. You could just qualify individually based off of. So for example, if I'm dealing with a business that's based out of you know, um, an SST state like Kentucky and their headquartered Kentucky, Kentucky is automatically knocked out, but we look at the other 23 states to see if they would be a good fit. Can't see the heading, my apologies. Um, yeah, so I, as I mentioned down here, no fixed place of business, um, less than $50,000 of property, and also the 25, uh, less than 25% of total property or payroll in the state. But the easiest way that we kind of identify it is, um, again, less than the 50,000 in payroll or a fixed place of business. Another question that comes up a lot is, when we are dealing with a business that's existing, meaning, you know, obviously not a brand new business, um, we are able to get them registered in the SST program thereafter in states that they're already registered in for filing and remitting. So it still is a, uh, a program that they're able to take advantage of, even if they've been registered in filing and remitting in a specific state. One of the uh, screenshots uh, that you know, is highly appreciated when we're doing our presentations back to a customer after we've kind of done a discovery is this screenshot right here. And basically this just represents our heat map. So on the Avatax dashboard on the landing page is a heat map of where businesses are registered, where the business is registered. But even though we're only filing and remitting in specific states, we are capturing all the data to determine when a business is crossing thresholds in other states, whether based off of transactions or dollars. And this is really where, you know, the compliance really takes over. So after we've kind of done a risk assessment determined up until today, this is that ongoing nexus tracking for a business that gives them a peace of mind moving forward that they don't have to go back and do a whole risk assessment and compliance project with Avalara where we're tracking all of their economic thresholds right here on the landing page. So this one is you know, very important when we are kind of um, presenting because that's kind of the aha moment that you know, a lot of customers really, really appreciate and we're looking for. Exemption certificate management. So as I had mentioned before, you know, if we do need to collect exemption certificates, we have that management tool to basically collect, store, track, report that um, those certificates and map those directly to a customer. Um, Avalara Tax Research, uh, this is a very sought after, sought after product or solution, if you wanna call it, where you get access to Avalara's tax attorneys. So there's 130, for, uh, excuse me, Avalara Tax Research 
was a company that Avalara partnered with up until about 19 months ago. And then Avalara purchased tax research and they became part of the Avalara family. So we work specifically with their tax attorneys um, with all different types of up-to-date tax research. When I hear kind of on a call with a customer that, you know, they get, you know, a lot of their information and knowledge from Google or a CPA that's possibly, you know, headquartered in their home state, but is not that familiar with sales and use tax and nexus laws in other states. And they really don't feel confident in some of the answers that they get. You know, really having that support from Avalara Tax Research um, has been a huge benefit to businesses. Drop shipping, mapping. So we do drop ship mapping through Avalara Tax Research. Um, you know, as it says there, product taxability. So we will, you know, research and make sure that all of the products have the correct tax codes through Avalara Tax Research. And they have a lot of updated Nexus laws that are, you know, shared with our customers as well to keep everything kind of compliant and up to date. Use tax. Um, typically, when we are dealing with a business with use tax, I would submit a case to somebody like Wendy to kind of identify and dig a little bit deeper. Um, you know, it provides a lot of different features for tax calculations like address validation um, or, excuse me, um, you know, just what types of returns that are being done for use tax. And, you know, we kind of scope out those projects um, by state with our product engineers to be able to, you know, obviously incorporate that into um, Avatax. Another one, uh, the reason why I was relatively kind of late to this call was I just got off a call um, with a business that was looking to us for, you know, just the you know, basic sales tax calculations and filing and remitting. But I always ask about some other types of, you know, additional products that Avalara offers. And it's basically our business license and permit management system. So when you have businesses that have a lot of different licenses and permits, um, whether they need to keep them up, renewals, um, you know, having so many tasks to keep up with, we bring in our experts um, from Avalara License Management to kind of take a look at how we could streamline that process too and keep everything under one umbrella. I will stop there. Any questions? And sorry if I moved a little too fast on any of the slides. Um, the only one question that came in uh, was about the exemption sales. It says, I have a lot of exempt sales, but not sure about my exemption certificates. Uh, what happens if my exemptions aren't up to date? Yep, and I I didn't notice a slide on there and I appreciate you bringing that up. So obviously, you know, um, and Wendy will talk to it too, our cert capture exemption tool is where we store the exemption certificates and map those to the customers. Another side to that service is called managed services. That's where our exemption certificate are, excuse me, that's for managed services. That's where we work with a customer on doing campaigns to your customers that have exempt sales to A, go out and collect any missing certificates. B, we're going to look at all of those exemption certificates to see if they're the correct certificate, if any are outdated. And then we do email campaigns on behalf of a customer to go out and collect those. So it's a project um, that we work directly with customers on looking how many exemption certificates and customers you do have, how many certificates do you think you have and what you do have, and then how we can go about getting you 100% compliant or close to it as possibly can by getting those certificates all collected. And when I say like our team really um, takes over that project, I mean, we have customers that will say, hey, we collect them right now and they're in a binder or they're in a drawer in an office. We literally will have them send those hard copies to our team to pull out the staples, to pull out the paper clips, and we digitize everything and map it to the customers. So sorry if that was a little long-winded. I definitely wanted to touch on the managed services piece, but you know, the, the short version is, is we go over 
what your exempt customers look like, what you have collected, and then assist you with letting you know what you need to have collected. And there is a solution that helps us go out and actually do it for you um, if you want to choose Avalara to take on that project. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. And that's the only question that came in, so we can move on to the demo. Great. Appreciate it, Wendy. I will. All right. So this is Avatax. I'm going to just cover a couple of things throughout we're going and reference to, and this is what Brian was just talking about, right? So Avatax, um, this is the portal that you will see. There is a whole deep engine behind the scenes. The whole point of Avatax, the tax engine, is to make real-time tax decisions. It's connected to your ERP. It would be connected to your e-commerce or maybe your CRM system, wherever it is that you've got customers that are asking for prices and you're trying to provide an accurate all-in price pricing, whether it's a quote, whether it's a final transaction, you would call in and we've got all of these pre-built integrations into uh, your ERP, into probably your e-commerce and your CRM. There's a thousand different integrations. And the whole thing is it ties in behind the scenes. Um, so you'd have a bunch of integrations that are in the system that it's calling in. And these pre-built integrations, or if you've got a proprietary system, we've got a lot of web calls behind the scenes, API end calls, endpoints that you can write your own integration. It's really not that heavy, and we have a lot of documentation and support around it. But we want to be able to help you. And when we're talking real-time tax calculations, we're talking a go-forward basis. Brian spent a lot of time talking about what is your nexus situation today? What is your obligation? Where are you currently? registered and perhaps you have some previous liability. That's a process of kind of cleaning up, getting registered and things like that. And as you get registered, a couple things will happen with you. If you're already registered in a state, these things are already happening, right? That is that number one, you get a taxpayer ID, you get, you know, you're registered with the Department of Revenue, you should start collecting tax on potentially taxable transactions um, going forward, right, within that state. The other thing, and you will come in and you will tell Avatax where you're currently registered. So the states you have Nexus in, that you're registered in, and then as your profile might change, you'd go through a registration process, whether that's a voluntary disclosure, whether there's amnesty, whether you're just registering, however that works, they're gonna give you an effective date that says, hey, you're now registered with our state, you should consider tax, you know, should collect tax as of whatever date, June 1st. So you just come in and update any future registrations and say it will be effective June 1st. So that real-time integration into your systems is going to pull through every transaction. I'd like to say that your system will think generally that all states are taxable, all customers are taxable, all goods and services are taxable, which does not mean you will charge tax all the time. It means your tax decision will be made by Avatax. And that tax decision, depending on your profile, will very often be zero a bunch of the time. If you, you don't have nexus in a state, you're not registered, zero tax. Avatax still made that tax decision, still recorded it, and uh, sent it back to the taxing mechanism in your system. If your customer has an exemption certificate for the state of transaction, zero tax, but Avatax recorded it, you know, made the decision, why is there no tax, recorded it, sent it back. If the thing that you're selling on this particular invoice isn't taxable in that particular location, zero tax. So lots of reasons why the tax decision might be zero, but in all cases, Avatax is making that decision from when you have Nexus in a particular state or even previous. But once you have, um, well, you know, it's the tax decision. Again, it will always be zero before you register. Um, but you'll also, when you register, identify what it is the state wants you, how, what's the compliance? What are your requirements for giving the, the tax that you're calculating? Remember, this is the state's tax, the local jurisdiction's tax, and you're just facilitating that on those sales. And they'll tell you when you register, how often are you to um, submit reports and money to them. Is it monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, annually? And they'll tell you the forms that you're required. And they'll tell you whether they want paper returns and checks, which is pretty rare these days, much going to be online for the most part. Okay, so you'll just tell Avatax, the tax, you know, the portal, what your profile is. Again, where you're registered and those places that you are registered, what it is that you are, uh, you know, what your requirements are for as a taxpayer. So one of the key things, uh, and we talked about this a lot in the presentation a minute ago, is your economic nexus. Remember, there are lots of triggers for when you've hit nexus requirements. That's that threat, that, that 
that business activity at which the state can compel you as a company to register uh, or hold you liable if not right so that's the nexus uh, and there's lots of triggers there's we already discussed people places things click through affiliates and in the last few years, we've got this economic. We don't necessarily know where you have employees. We don't necessarily know where you're holding inventory, but we do know your transactions. So we're able to help you with that. So we've got front and center on your homepage, an economic nexus um, map that's letting you know. So any place that you have told the system that you are already registered, that place is going to stay zero. So if you're registered in California, California will never show up highlighted here because this map is exclusively to tell you, hey, here's where you are approaching or have hit some economic nexus thresholds and you have some potential action to take. So if you've got, if you're registered already, you have no potential action, you've already done it. You're collecting tax, right? If you're nowhere near those thresholds, you have no potential action because you're, you don't have an obligation and you're not reasonably going to immediately, right? But if you're getting close, we're going to let you know. So approaching is anywhere 80% to 100% of that threshold. We're going to highlight it yellow. You'll be able to come in and see it. Uh, and we're going to give you the percentage of what it is. We're always going to tell you, and as Brian mentioned, it's combination, usually one or the other, of the volumes that you are selling and the dollar amounts that you're selling. So your sales threshold, how much money are your customers buying from you? And then the volume threshold is how many transactions. So it's typically one or the other. So we're going to tell you which of which of those you've hit or you're potentially hitting that threshold and the period for which it is. Now, as you actually meet a threshold, so hit the dollar amount or the volumes, uh, we're going to highlight that orange to let you know it's a little bit more urgent as you, uh, you know, kind of hover over it. We'll see Kansas. We have really exceeded <laughs> the threshold there. We're at 900% of the potential threshold. Um, this does cover whether it is taxable or non-taxable. Remember, we talked about some states have gross sales. So it's whether it's a transaction that's taxable or non-taxable, it goes to that threshold. Some states are just taxable sales. These, um, you know, this knows the types of transactions that you've got because we're the ones making the tax decisions for you. So it's going to take that into consideration. The states that only want to see taxable, that's what's going to use. If you hit it, you've hit it because of the if it's gross, then we're giving it to you based on the gross numbers that you've hit. And again, this is um, something that you're not needing to track on a daily basis. Generally, you're going to see when you start approaching and you're going to know if I'm approaching something in April or May, there's a good shot I'm going to hit it this year. If I'm approaching it the last week of December, I'm probably good for another year. Um, and you know, so you're always able to see what's going on with the, the transactions that we, we know of. And you can go register or just in the app and places, you can ask Avalara to do that registration process for you. If you decide, yep, I do want to get registered in, in these various states, plus I might as well go ahead and get started on my approaching as well. You just uh, trigger the piece inside of the system. You can always also get in touch with somebody uh, at Avalara and talk with them about it as well. You'll have a dedicated account person that understands your account, has access to your system and data and things like that thing to help you with support. Okay. So the other thing is behind the scenes, the um, we're embedded again where you're doing your invoicing, where you're doing your quoting or where you've got your shopping carts, things like that. And we've got the transactions that uh, identify those various different pieces. So as we've got transactions, it's sending over, again, this bundle of information, the pre-built integrations into your ERP system or the ones that you're writing yourself. Um, it's gonna grab certain pieces because we, we looked at kind of that iceberg. We saw that there are certain data elements that every tax decision is based on. And that's going to be um, what addresses are in play. What's the date? What's it also sends over? Where is your transaction in the invoicing process? So if it's a quote, we want to get you the exact right price. I mean, tax for the price. We want your customer to understand all in pricing, but we also know that that is not finalized. It's not hitting your GL. Customers not executing on it until. It moves later in the process. And so as it goes to quoting, it gets you the tax, but it doesn't record it as finalized. When it's finalized and invoicing and you post that to your GL, that's when it comes over and it lets Avatax know, hey, record this as a finalized transaction because Avatax is going to help you with all of the reporting and the ribbons and compliance piece of it for consolidating the data. It aggregates it all, figures out the jurisdictions and all of the subcoding and things like that. Okay. 
So that's by default. In fact, everything, once you do the implementation process, will be yeah, by default, the transactions will just come to Avatax behind the scenes. Avatax will consume and pass it through. So it's really important that we get the setups correctly so that all these things can happen accurately behind the scenes. Okay, so as we're making decisions, again, it's passing over where it is in the invoicing, what's the document, what are the dates involved, excuse, yeah, dates involved, where the address is involved, what customer is the customer identifier is involved, and what's on your invoice that you're invoicing for. So it's going to pass over key information about what it is that you're invoicing, amounts. Now you're just passing over the amount of the invoice because that's what the, um, you know, the ERP is going to send over. And then we're doing kind of these pieces from here, identifying, hey, is it taxable? Is it non-taxable? Is there tax on it? And we use this, this logic every time. First thing we always look to do is see, hey, for this potentially taxable state, do you even have Nexus? Have you told Avatax you're registered there? Yes, you have. You're registered in California. Great. If you were not, then the next piece would be not applicable, right? Doesn't matter who the customer is. If you're not registered, no tax. That's easy. We'd record it. We'd send it back. We'd also compare it against your thresholds, right? You do have Nexus there. So the next thing we look to see is, hey, is this customer taxable in this state, meaning well, I guess, have they provided an exemption certificate? In this case, we can see, no, the customer has not provided a certificate, therefore they are a taxable customer. And we're gonna go to the next piece of it, which is, is this good or service taxable in this particular location? And we're identifying what it is because there's a tax code. This code right here is an Avalara goods and service code. We've got about 3,000 of them, but most of our customers are using 10 or fewer to identify everything that it is that you're selling from a taxable taxability perspective, right? So is it tangible personal property? Is it software? If it's software, what kind of software? If it's services, what kind of services? Remember, there's the difference between um, for lawyers and plumbers and service calls and um, just implementation and consulting kinds of fabrication and all sorts of different types of services that the states make decisions around. I have many clients that say I'm not taxable because I sell services and I'm like that's true in many states but not in all states. And it depends on the types of services, where, how that is, right? And so we've got a tool that helps you identify the code that goes with what it is that you're selling. So is it an extended warranty that they're purchasing? Is it freight? Is it, you know, all these different types of things are treated differently depending on the state. And the key here is we're really laying the groundwork so that as your profile changes and expands, you're not having to do any additional legwork. You're just coming in and turning on the Nexus. You just update where you are. This code you are selling, this ginned cotton one ton, no matter what state you're selling it in, it is the same thing. And so you only need one code. And then that's where we're looking at the context of this code. Where is it that you're, cons you're, you're selling this for your customer to see how is it taxable? Right? So you're not saying taxable, not taxable, you're just saying, what is it that you're selling in a way that Avatax will understand, which again is our, um, our tax codes. Okay, So that's when we're looking to see, is this taxable? We're looking to see what it is it that you're selling, and then is it taxable here? And then we're always looking to see the addresses. What sales tax jurisdiction? So you guys would be completely out of the um, sales tax jurisdiction game of guessing to see is this particular address in city limits or is it out of city limits? Is it unincorporated county? Does the county have a tax rate? Does, you know, like are there any special districts and things like that? So all of that goes away. You will simply use Avatax and Avatax will look at the address for every time you have that transaction just in case we voted in a 1% transportation tax or that transportation <laughs> tax we voted in three years ago is now expiring. You don't have to track any of that. We'll look to see at this point in time, what are the jurisdictions that that address is in? What's the sourcing? So we wanna know ship to and ship from because some states care. This is cross, cross state, so interstate. So it's gonna be destination based. And then the rates, of course. Rates are kind of the last piece that are applied. Everybody thinks sales tax is all about rates, but that's a really tiny part of the tax decision. And then whatever rates are against the taxable component. So if this wasn't taxable, 
all of the amount would be in the non-taxable amount. The taxable component would be zero. So all those rates times zero, so it would be zero. In this case, it was taxable. And then we do that for each line item. So you'll see in this case, for this particular line item, we're seeing that, that we've identified the freight that it is. And then we're saying that, yes, in fact, this freight is taxable. Many states are gonna say freight is not taxable as long as it's just a pass through shipping, common carrier, things like that. So it's really important for those variable taxability pieces that we understand what they are so we can identify. So we'll do line item by line item, exact same exercise each time. We're gonna give you a summary back and it's gonna use the regular taxing fields in your source system, but we're gonna be making the tax decision for you. All right, so that's a taxable one. Here's one that just has an exemption certificate on file. You'll see, hey, is there an exemption certificate? Yes, there is. We can see that this is, well, this is for Georgia. So there's a small chance that exactly the same thing. And we can see that it is the same code as my last transaction. Um, but in this case, it is there's no tax on it. And that's because there's a certificate that's involved. And we can see that we moved this over to the non-taxable status. We can also see here, I wanna point this out to you, the tax certificate applied. So this is a document ID that, go, that not only says, why did I not charge tax on this transaction? Well, because you had a certificate, um, but is physically putting in the transaction details and closing that audit loop for not only do I know you have a certificate and I referenced it, I've included in the transaction details the actual certificate. And that is a document ID for the certificate that you're storing in the Avalara ecosystem that, that you're using the larger exemption system to manage. So that is a document ID that's going to start capture and you're able to go to any of these different uh, items and see exactly what's happening with them. So this is expiring certificates. It is not expired yet. It's gonna expire later in the month. That means it's queued up for communication. So it's tracking, it's applying your expiration dates. It's tracking them on any given certificate. It's queuing up ones that are coming, makes it very easy. The system can communicate with your customers. It sends an email to the customer that lets them know this is coming up to expire. You can always look at an individual certificate that you've got on file. You can see the details of it. You can see um, when you received it and things like that. You can see what communication you've sent. Um, you can also, I'm gonna pull up a new customer that just came on board for pretensies. And we can see that we have nothing on file currently. We have three states that we're expecting exemption certificates for, but we haven't received any of those. This means that if we're billing this customer at this very moment, we're billing them if it's a, otherwise, if you've got Nexus and you, you don't have a certificate, the product's taxable, all states you'd have a, a exemption, you'd have a taxable transaction. Um, we're expecting that these are the ones that they're, you know, they've told us, I'm gonna send you certificates here. We can also see we've sent a request on this and we can see a full history of exactly when we've added them to the system, who did it, and that we have sent them a request for these states to my customer's email address. This is the systems, Avatax, Avalara system, ecosystem, sending communication um, to the designated contact you've got for your customer. I can see exactly what was sent to my customer. I can pull it up, see the communication. I can see that actually I did also, I knew the states and I knew the reasons and I attached these partially completed certificates. That's an option that you can do through the system is send the, the certificates you're expecting. If you don't know, or if your customers are not great about following instructions and they're giving you a lot of not great documents, then you can always have them go out online. There is a tool that's included in the system that's called Cert Express. And this is a self-help tool for your customers to submit certificates and they can come in add any document that they want. So if they're like, hey, what about Mississippi? Well, add Mississippi, that's fine. Or they can very quickly and very easily identify exactly their reason for exemption. We already knew we were expecting California, so they're executing on that. They don't have to know the resale certificate in California. Your team doesn't have to know. The system tells them, oh, that's a California 230. They could import their existing document or they can complete it in this process. They're going to be engaged in my demo site sells computers. And I've configured it with a drop down list of what I'm selling. So I sell some hardware, I sell some services around that, and they can move on. Now, 
if I hadn't answered all those questions as a customer, it's going to stop me for what's required. It does let me know that these are required fields on here. I would have done the same on the last screen. And I'm going to sign it and submit it. This is completely black browser driven. So your customer doesn't need any specialized hardware or specialized or you see I didn't log into anything. Just that link included in the communication is customized to your customer. This would be your customer. This would be you guys. This is the seller in this case, equivalent to you. This is your customer making purchases saying, hey, I've got some exemptions. You can send them communication. They submit them that way. We just completed a certificate. They can get a copy if they want to. They don't have to get it to you because this is everything speaking to each other. So the system immediately knows that you now have a California exemption certificate, that all of the required fields were populated. We knew it was the right form. I've got a configuration that says auto accept that certificate and Avatax now knows about it. So immediately loops that in and is a seamless process for your customer. Okay, customers are not required to use that process. That is an option they can always import from there. They can always just email you the documents. Lots of ways you can go uh, just highlighting kind of the focus of, of the system. So storing them, validating them, helping your customers submit them, and then of course linking it in as a part of the transaction details. Okay, and then once we've got all of that, we'll do your returns for you. You've already told us where you're registered and your filing requirements. So we can then go in and do all of that filing piece direct with the government for you. So it's like parallel outsourcing. There'll be one treasury event between you and customer. And then we will work with, excuse me, between you and us, we will have that one treasury event. And then we will work with each jurisdiction you're filing in make sure they get all the copies of the returns that they're submitted timely, which is a guarantee we will file timely. Uh, you can always come in and get copies of any payment confirmations, any returns that we filed on your behalf. Anytime um, jurisdictions might send you questions or notices about returns we filed, just come in here and import them in. That's our cue to work with the jurisdiction to resolve any of those notices. And that's really kind of the overall cycle on the, the sales tax ongoing piece of it. There's a lot of other things that we've talked about that we can um, talk about individually, but that's the piece that we want to just kind of give you an insight of how those pieces interact with each other and how they look and work uh, within your systems. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so we actually have a few minutes uh, for some questions. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, uh, we can uh, read them out loud. So it looks like one that just came in. It says, how can a customer sign in and attach their own exempt certificate. So they, um, you've got a couple different ways depending on how you're already interacting with your customer. So if you have an online portal, if you have e-commerce or something like that, you can embed the exemption process into that. So they're already, uh, you know, that's already gated. They're, they've got an account in e-commerce or maybe a payment portal or something like that. You can just add and it's pretty easy API. So customers can submit their certificate, either go through that process to create one or just ingest one. They can, uh, send it in there. But also there was a little import your certificate. So as you send communication to here's how you can supply your certificate, you can create it or supply it. They can just upload it as a part of that process as well. It's a really flexible piece of it. Perfect. Thanks, Wendy. And just for time, we'll just go ahead and wrap up. So thank you all again for joining us today. If you do have any additional questions or like a recording to the webinar, then please reach out to your assigned account manager or you can email us at am at acumenfl.com. Uh, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and also follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook to stay up to date on the latest Sage content. Uh, again, thank you all again for watching our webinar Wednesday. Thank you, Avalara, for the great presentation, and we hope to see you guys all again soon. Appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.